people. Okay, good. Uh, this is my third nut dab, first one in person. Uh, some of you may remember that two years ago, I gave a talk on I-10, which was a new storage stack, CPU efficient storage stack for the kernel. Uh, last year, I gave a talk on uh, understanding the CPU overheads of transport designs. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that I've been working for over eight years. So let me tell you a little bit of the history of this project. Uh, the year was 2014. Uh, the university was UC Berkeley. Scott Schenker, some of you may know, um, and Yonis Stoika, Sylvia Ratnasamy, and I were sitting in this room trying to understand uh, why everybody's complaining about transport protocols. How many of you have actually worked on kernel transport? Okay, very good. There are at least five or six people who have worked on kernel transport. At least two of these people I know are very upset about kernel transport. And we were trying to understand why is everybody complaining about kernel transport? And we were trying to also understand that where the world was heading, this was eight years ago, data centers were still using 10 gigabit links, and people were starting to tell us that uh, um, there's some problem with kernel transport, especially TCP. And that's where this question between Jan Stoika, Scott Schenker, Sylvia, and me started popping in, what did we do? So that's where this project started. And eight years later today, I'm going to tell you about what I have learned. This is not the final word, but hopefully you will tell me what you think we should improve in our learning, and hopefully we'll continue learning until we solve the problem. Uh, I'm a little bit of an OS person, I'm a little bit of a networking person, and I'm a little bit of a theoretician. So this talk is going to be a slight mix of all of those. Um, but let's see. So this project is currently called DCPEM. So I have to also ask one more question. How many of you think, or how many of you actually have worked on switch architectures? One person. Interesting. Okay, two or three people. Okay, so some of you may realize some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So DCPEM, this is the current name of the project. Um, it stands for Data Center PIM. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, paper was supposed to be, or this project was supposed to be presented by a student uh, who couldn't make it here, so I have been given the task. Uh, this looks something like a data center, and what my student wanted to tell you first is that he has done a very hard work in open sourcing everything, and multiple community members, including five independent members from the SICOM community, uh, have actually reproduced all these results. So all these results that I'm going to show you on a cloud, uh, cloud lab testbed, all the simulation results, everything is reproducible. Okay, let's get started. So, I wanted to start with this big picture that I was talking about. Is it time to rethink Linux networking? Uh, and uh, you guys know much more than I do, uh, but uh, I want to start with this point so that we are all on the same page, that Linux networking, we should call it success already, right? Uh, you all deserve the credit. You all have done amazing work. Linux network stack is still the most used network stack today, and we should be proud of it. Um, it has evolved significantly over the years, right? In particular, uh, we have seen new protocols, we have seen new implementations, new optimizations, and a lot of things. But despite all these work that has happened in the Linux network stack over the last 10, 15, 20, 40 years, it has remained very stable, very consistent, and it casts a very wide net, right? The same network stack is working for data centers, the same with minor changes, minor configuration changes. The same network stack is working for wide area, and so on. I would call it a success, and you should. But looking into the future. I think there are some things that we need to think about. We all, I hope, agree that terabit ethernet is inevitable. The way terabit ethernet is, is defined is anything beyond 100 Gbps. Let me show you some numbers. If you haven't thought about these numbers, okay, just consider 200 <laughs> gigabit mix. A single MTU size packet, you're going to receive at line rate for 200 gigabit mix every 60 nanoseconds, one MTU size packet at line rate. 60 nanoseconds, that's faster than memory read write latencies. The unloaded hardware RTD, transmission delays are no longer the bottleneck. The unloaded hardware RTD is basically speed of light RTD, 10 microseconds, right? And if you think about it, at 100 gigabit per second, with 10 microsecond RTDs, if you're spending multiple round-trip times 
just trying to have your con con uh, congestion control protocol converge to the right rate, you are spending multiple hundreds of packets worth of bandwidth wasting. And finally, if you think a little bit more, uh, 100 kilobyte data takes 14 microseconds to go from one end of the network to another end of the network in an unloaded scenario. Just think about these numbers for a second and you will see the complexity that we should be thinking about. So there are these new high performance demands that John also talked about this morning uh, that are coming up. And as kernel networking community, we should think whether we want to adapt to this new world, whether we want to say that we want to continue having more and more celebratory songs or do we just call it a success and stop, okay? The warning signs are there. All of us know that Google's and Microsoft's and, and Facebook's or Meta uh, are implementing very high performance network stacks. These stacks are far from stable. They are far from consistent and they cast a very narrow net. So they have much to catch up with Linux network stack, but if we don't do anything, they will catch up. So we must adapt and we must adapt soon. So that's the big picture. Okay, so what do we need to really adapt to? What are these high performance demands? Uh, one thing that you will hear over and over again, and John talked about a lot in the morning, is this latency frustration problem. So let me give you, let me show you some measurement results here. Um, okay, so this is a graph on the x-axis. I'm showing you some latency numbers on the y-axis. I'm going to tell you what fraction of packets or measurements, I'm doing per packet measurements in a large scale hyperscaler, very large scale. This is, think about hundreds of thousands of machines. And what fraction of packets uh, saw a certain RTT? So if you look at any X value, say 600, whatever is the Y value, that's the fraction of packets that had latency less than 600, okay? So it's a CDF. Okay, surprise, surprise. If you look at this graph, this looks something like this. There are very few packets that have very low latency. Remember, we are talking about 10, 20 microseconds unloaded RTTs, okay? There are around 25% of the packets that get less than 200 microseconds. At median, we are already beyond uh, 400 microseconds. And at tail, I'm spending 1,400 microseconds to send one packet from one end of the network to another end of the network, which should usually take only 20 microseconds. It's terrible. So why is it? Um, you will see it to appear soon. I'll soon show you the idea why this is happening. But uh, let me try and dig deeper and see what is the root cause of this end to end tail latency, yes? So that's where I'm going to switch to some of the measurements that we have done and show you some of the interesting things. So most of you will already know this slide, but let me just walk you through. So the way kernel network stack works, there's some hardware NIC uh, talking to device driver, there's some network subsystem, IP TCP layers, and then there's some interface to the applications. And the packet comes in, you have all these different uh, uh, subsystems that the packet is passing through. So here I'm doing a very simple experiment where I'm sending in a packet all the way to the application and sending it back. This is a very small packet because I want to care only about latency here, okay? And I want to understand which part of the subsystem is taking how much latency, okay? So there's some IFQ processing, mapping processing, IP TCP layer processing, there's some data copy. Latency-wise, just latency-wise, I'm not caring about throughput right now, I'm not caring about CPU utilization, just latency-wise, what do you think takes the most uh, hit? Yes. yes. Okay, so NAPI scheduling data copy. Remember this 64 byte. This is a very small packet. Okay, so good. So the guess is NAPI scheduling and data copy. Um, let's see. So I'm going to show you some numbers on very high percentile latency, so 99.9%, okay? And this is isolated traffic. So right now there's a single flow or single packet going through the stack and there's no other contention, okay? Good. If I look at the latency numbers, what this is showing is that most of my latency comes from the IFT processing. 
Yes, very simple. It's a hybrid processing that gets me most of the latency. Everything else, yes, there's some scheduling overhead where threats, uh, threat scheduling hits take some two or three or 1.52 microseconds sometimes, but otherwise we are doing fine. 25 microseconds. Going back to that picture, remember 1400 microseconds end to end. And here in an unloaded site, I'm only spending roughly speaking, you know, 20 microseconds. Okay, not even a small fraction, it's, it's negligible, host latency. Okay, now let me show you what happens when there is actually some contention. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the eight cores on my system and start loading it with more and more flows. Okay. All right, so there are two important components here, interrupt handling and thread scheduling overheads. So let me now overload the system or start loading the system up. And what I'm going to do is, um, oh, tell it is for me. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is load up the system, load up the system more and more. Okay, so what's going to happen? What I'm going to show you is that there is more and more CPU contention that will start happening, yes? Uh, here's the number. So I have number of active flows per core. Sorry, this is number of active flows per core. Um, and when I have, uh, sorry, num total number of active flows uh, across the eight cores. When I have around 64 cores, I actually see substantial latency increase already, right? This is around uh, um, 370 microseconds. And then as soon as I go to 128, concurrent flows, sending and receiving these uh, uh, packets, small packets, I see latency is going beyond in milliseconds, okay? Good, um, and if I look at the distribution, where is the latency coming from? Almost everything is coming from thread scheduling. For some of you who have done these low level measurements, you'll realize that this is not surprising. I have 128 threads sharing a core. Right? I'm using a Linux kernel CPU scheduler. This should not be very surprising. Okay, okay. so here I have a problem because now I'm spending 1.5 milliseconds or two milliseconds in terms of uh, uh, just uh, you know, sending the packets around. Uh, and that could be the reason why we were seeing such high latencies in the last uh, you know, hyperscaler experiment. Okay, so let me dig deeper into this. Okay, uh, so this was my result. Uh, and I noticed that arc scheduling is, is uh, the main bottleneck, but I was using kernel. Kernel CPU scheduler was not optimized for microsecond scale, right? In fact, if you look at default scheduling parameters, three millisecond is the default CFS uh, um, parameter. So I'm going to change. Why should I stick with those default parameters? If I'm uh, trying to understand a problem, I should change that parameter and try to see what I can do the best. So what I'm doing here is, I just changed that optimized Linux optimized parameter to from um, three milliseconds to 100 microseconds, okay? And suddenly my latency came down uh, to almost 500, 600 microseconds. It's still high, but I already reduced it by a significant factor, okay? And I'm not going to tell you this, uh, what this Linux++ plus plus is, but using some very, very simple optimization, less than 10 lines of code, you can bring down this latency to this. Less than 10 lines of code, you can bring down this latency to tens uh, of microseconds, actually less than 10 of microseconds. So very, like, like, as if everything was isolated. And this is what hyperscalers have actually implemented. We went to them, we showed them, they said, ah, we already know this, we have done this. So all these measurements were infertile, yes, we learned something, we learned something amazing actually here, uh, but um, you know, they already were doing this. So then back to this graph, where is this latency coming from if they're already doing this? Host doesn't matter, host latency is 20 microseconds, 25 microseconds, why am I seeing this 1400 microsecond latency? Now, we can ask that, okay, if host is not the problem, right, whoever is talking about host latency being the problem, uh, they are, they are, uh, they should not be using default Linux parameters. So what is the problem? Uh, how about the network? So where, where else does latency come from? Yes, there is the uh, host side, there's transmission propagation delays, and then there are these queuing delays. Yes, queuing delays in the network. So let's see what are those queuing delays look like. Remember hyperscalers, actually unlike what John said, they actually see packet drops in the core, uh, right? There are actually significant packet drops. I'm measuring 99.9% .9 latency. Right? Even if there were 0.1% packet drops, 
one single packet drop will lead to high latency. Yes. So let's see what happens when I have one packet drop, some switch buffer is full and that's why that packet was dropped. Yes. Which means some packet is sitting at the end of the buffer that needs to be dequeued at some point at line rate. So I'm going to take the maximum buffer size divided by line rate in an ideal scenario that would give me the tail latency of because of that queuing delay, right? Or the queuing delay. So let's look at some numbers. Switch buffer size is going from 16 megabytes to most recent 128 megabytes. And let's start where I started, 2014. Okay, 10 gigabits. If you do these calculations, in 10 gigabit links, it took 12 milliseconds to drain a 16 megabyte switch buffer. Yes? Uh, and if you had 64 megabyte at that time, it would take 48 milliseconds. Now, 100 gigabits. Whoa, I'm still taking 1.2 to 9.6 milliseconds to drain a switch buffer when the buffer gets filled up. And if you go look into the future with 400 gigabits where we expect 64 to 128 megabyte switch buffer sizes at least, I'm gonna take 1.2 to 2.4 milliseconds every time a packet is dropped just for the tail latency hit. So whoever is talking about host latencies, they don't matter because every time any buffer gets filled up, you are gonna see that 1.2 millisecond tail latency. Okay, so half of my research was killed when I realized this. Yes, because I work on the host side. Okay, so the main problem is buffers filling up. Yes, and that's where congestion control kicks in. Okay, and the whole idea should be that how do we keep this buffer occupancy low? So coming back, now I can give you the result that this latency, we also did the measurement where we tried to figure out what was the queuing delays being introduced in this experiment and it almost overlaps. All the delay in a hyperscaler at 100,000 machines is coming because of queuing delays buffers building up. Except for that small difference at the, uh, at the low end tail latency where, where actually host latency matters, okay? Okay, good. So host does not contribute to high tail latencies. The tail latency is due to switch buffers building up and that leads to all kinds of problems, queuing delays, retransmission delays, timeouts. It's basically a messed up world after that. Okay, so how do we think in this case about designing low latency kernel transport design going back that we want low latency, microsecond scale latency. So now we have some idea. We have to somehow contain switch buffers. I have to reduce for the short flows or however you want to think about latency sensitive flows, I have to make sure that they are not queued behind other flows in the switch buffer, okay? At, not at the host, host doesn't matter, at the switch buffers. Okay, so I want to make sure. We know two mechanisms that already exist in the kernel, right? Uh, by the way, once we have taken care of this, we can come back and think about, uh, okay, shall we do connectionless, connection, host delays matter, speed of flight limits, how do we do that? We can all come back to that. But one very simple mechanism, which most people don't even evaluate, is that TCP actually allows you, kernel allows you to set priorities, right? Just use those priorities. If you look at any academic paper, they say, I'm gonna evaluate Linux in its default configuration. And then they complain, oh, TCP had bad performance. If you care about latency, use priorities. They exist there to enable that differentiation of service, okay? So one possibility is that if you want to use kernel transport, use priorities, and then you will see zero or minimal contention between short flows and long flows. There will be contention between short flows and short flows, or latency sensitive flows, but you will separate out short and long flows, yes? Okay, and that will get rid of a lot of problems already. Or you have another side, which is think about congestion avoidance, right? What Warren talked about many years ago. Let's think about congestion avoidance and ensure minimal buffer occupancy at all times. So we will allow contention, but we'll try to minimize it. And that's where one of the questions that Warren and Nick asked, Nick McKeown, some of you may know, two years ago, he gave the keynote here. He asked this question, right? What is the buffer occupancy that we need to keep? Who said zero? Who said zero? You are my hero. Who said zero? Oh, it's zero. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Alistair, yes. Uh, yes. See, the problem with zero occupancy is that what happens 
when your link gets stripped. Suppose you want to keep zero occupancy. You have one short packet, a latency sensitive packet that arrives, you forward it. Now you have nothing to forward at this. Or you may have nothing to forward because the sender is not sending you the data, it's keeping the buffer occupancy zero. So the answer, the perfect answer, is not zero. And that's where a lot of gap is in congestion control literature. The perfect answer is you want to keep the outgoing link busy for next one RTT. One round trip time, you want to keep the outgoing link busy. And hence, you should have what we call one VDP worth of packets sitting in the switch buffers. And that's why TCP keeps one VDP of packets in flight all the time. That is the core concept. Yes? So we want one VDP worth of data sitting there at the switch. And other than that, use priorities. Right? If you, if you really want to get lowest possible latency, keep one, uh, one VDP worth of packets uh, in the switch buffers, use priorities, and you're fine. You will have good latency and good network utilization. OK? <coughs> Very good. So now we know what is the ideal buffer occupancy. How do we get to that buffer occupancy? Uh, remember that even if I want to not use, I want to use priorities, it's okay if you have only one VDP worth of packets in the switch buffer. That's all you need. Yes? Okay. But for some reasons, for example, I know that at least some of the hyperscalers are here. You don't want to use all the priorities for flow differentiation. There are other reasons uh, people use their priorities. So if you don't want to design a transport without priorities, all you need to do to minimize contention is to have one VDP worth of packets in flight. And um, this will reduce queuing delays, retransmissions, and drops to a minimal, not zero. You will still have large in gas, but uh, it will reduce it to very minimal value. And after that, we can do all these optimizations, connectionless, and everything. OK. So that takes care of latency. So now we have some picture about latency. What do we want? Use priorities. If you don't want to use priorities, keep one BDP worth of packets in the switch buffer, and that minimizes everything. How about network utilization? So this is slightly harder to give you numbers for, but I can tell you that a uh, uh, lot of uh, machines in a large hyperscaler are actually running at 50% or even less network utilization. Not because they desire them to run at such low utilization. So then the question comes is, OK, transport design always has two goals, low latency and high network utilization. How do I build this conceptual understanding that is so much easier for latency? How do I build that for utilization? So let's dig deeper into that. OK, so where does utilization come from? All of you know that most of the bytes are still in long flows. Right? In, large, in large clouds, uh, large data centers, most of the bytes are still in long flows, and that's where network utilization comes from. So why am I not having the receivers receive enough amount of data? Why is it that um, the network is not delivering enough amount of data to keep high network utilization? One reason is, remember that one BDP worth of packets sitting in the buffer, and short flows keep coming in, right? And those buffers are uh, just uh, sitting there. Um, so one reason is very simple, that long flows may contend with short flows right? Uh, at the switches. And this is fundamental if low latency is more important for you. Because if there is contention, either short flows will use higher priorities, in which case you will get low latency, or long flows will be able to go through, and you'll be fine in terms of utilization. So that's, that's an easier case, um, which there is a fundamental trade-off. The second one is long flows may contend with other long flows inside the network core. This could be because of ECMP hashings. This could be because of uh, uh, you know, the way routing is done. This could be because of many, many reasons. But it could also be because of a very realistic reason, which is data center oversubscription. Nobody designs the data center to be a full bisection bandwidth topology. There is always more bandwidth coming in at some of the switches than what is going out. This is called network oversubscription. Because of that network oversubscription, you can have long flows contending in because there is more data coming in than the switch can pump out. So this is a harder one, yes? But guess what? This is what congestion control protocols are designed to handle that I'm sending out some data, I'm not getting enough acts back, so I will slow down. Yes? OK, so this is a problem that we need to solve if you want to get high utilization. So remember this problem. We need to solve this problem. The second problem is super interesting, and 
some of you may have gotten the hint uh, this morning, which is long flows may actually contend with other long flows at host, at the last hop, right? So imagine 10 different senders from 10 different machines distributed in a data center sending data to one single receiver. This is called the in-cast problem, okay? And all these flows will contend for the last hop bandwidth, okay? And this was happening because those senders, when they started sending the data, they had no idea that nine other senders are also sending the data, right? And this is what I'm referring to as uncoordinated decisions between senders and receivers. For example, some of you may have thought about MapReduce style applications. Have you heard about MapReduce? Yes, or Spark, right? You have hundreds of uh, um, tasks running on hundreds of cores distributed. And these tasks may exchange data uh, in the shuffle round, right? So every machine might have data for every other machine. So think of this example, where I have certain number of machines on this side, certain number of machines on this side. And suppose all the machines have data to send to all other machines. And fix yourself one sender for a minute. Which receiver should this sender send data to? When all of them are starting their shuffle phase. Yes? How do I choose this sender? Should it send to this receiver first? Should it send to this receiver first? Or should it just do all the you know, fair um, uh, allocation and, and send them all at the same rate? But it could very well happen with kernel transport that all senders first decide to send to one receiver. Yes? And then they see congestion in the network, they back off, and then they start sending the second flow. Because I'm doing bandwidth estimation, I'm trying to guess the bandwidth, right? So then I tried this destination, it didn't work. Then I tried this destination, this, then this destination, this destination, and everywhere I'm creating the congestion, this is happening in a synchronized in cast scenario, but across destinations. Imagine going to Google, asking for restaurants, Google tells you a restaurant, you go there and they say no reservations. Then you go to the next restaurant, no reservations. Next restaurant, no reservations. You have to try many, many, many restaurants in a big city, unless you come from Ithaca. Uh, some of you know, may not know, I come from a small town where people complain if they have to stop at red lights. Uh, so unless uh, you're from Ithaca, uh, you will have to try many, many, many restaurants, right? And that's wasting your energy. The same way here, you might have to try different different receivers until you find the receiver or say that, okay, I, I'm able to send at high rate. Now, a lot of receiver-driven protocol people, <laughs> and I was one of the people that I wrote the first paper in this space, say that receiver-driven protocols solve this problem. And they don't. Because in receiver-driven protocols, uh, like John was talking about this morning, Receivers are sending tokens to the senders. How does this receiver decide which sender to send token to? Remember, these are hundreds of machines. How does one receiver decide which sender to send token to? What if all other receivers send token to that particular sender? The same problem. You want me to take that? Sorry, it's yeah. very hard for me to stand. Because I get very excited. Did you get this? I was trying to yeah. turn on. I was trying to turn on all the mics. Please go to one here. Okay. Sorry, I can. Oh, we're going to try a rope around. That's okay. That's okay. I'll, I'll try this. Working? Yeah. Sorry, I, I get too passionate, and then you know. Okay. Good. So, you want to reduce the volume? Okay. Sorry. Now I might be shouting. I have to. Okay, so how does that receiver decide which sender to send the token to? It has no idea which sender are other receivers sending token to. So all these receivers might end up sending token to one receiver or one sender or say five senders in the overcommitment rate, right? And hundreds of receivers sending tokens to five senders and all of them, only five are being utilized, 95 are sitting idle, but in both scenarios, both scenarios, what would have been the right answer is somehow they figure out, hey, I have data to send to all the receivers. 
you also have data to send to all the receivers. Why don't you choose that receiver? I will choose that receiver. I will choose that receiver and so on. There's some coordination needed, right? So now you might remember I asked you a question about who has worked on switch architectures. I don't know if some of you who have thought about these things. So I'm talking about this kind of coordination. This coordination is referred to as matchings, okay? Each sender is paired with a unique receiver after multiple rounds of control plane messages and the use of matchings has an extremely long history as long as condition control protocols uh, and they are implemented in almost every switch fabric you know of. Every switch that you have used implements this matching algorithm, okay? And the idea uh, was actually, uh, you know, uh, from one of our own, uh, Tom Anderson from UW and uh, Nick McKeown from Stanford actually came up with these beautiful protocols, variants of which are implemented in every switch fabric. Okay, so PIM and ISLIP protocols. They actually tell you that switches having multiple ports and multiple output ports, how do they coordinate to decide which port will send to which output port at any point of time? And this is where DCPIM comes in. Okay, so what I want to tell you in the next 10, 15 minutes, and this is where I will slightly speed up, is the, uh, what DCPIM really is, yes? So DCPIM, now you know the PIM protocol that is implemented in switches, this DCPIM is a data center generalization of that PIM protocol. It allows senders and receivers to coordinate in the background to decide how to get high utilization so that senders long flows do not compete at, in the network or at the host, sorry, at the host, and uh, to maintain this one BDP worth of buffer occupancy at each switch, and only one BDP worth of occupancy. So let me give you some ideas. So DCPIM, uh, unlike many other people, I would like to claim that DCPIM actually builds upon decades of work. <laughs> it was not the most original design ever. Um, it was built upon a decade of work on data center networks, so there has been a long history of this. This was the first uh, paper that we wrote in 2015 when, uh, when we started discussing this problem. And since then, it has taken me all this long time. And you will see Homa here, you will see NDP. Some of these protocols have actually built upon pre-host. So there's, a, there's this decade of work that this uh, DCPIM builds upon. It does one new thing, which is generalizing PIM to data centers, but many other ideas are from these previous protocols. Okay, so what is DCPIM doing? It's using matchings for congestion avoidance. It will just avoid congestion to begin with, okay? Some people also refer to them as proactive data center protocols. And the key insight in DCPIM is that we want to achieve high throughput for long flows, and for that, we only need one BDP worth of packets at any switch buffer at all times. Um, and the key insight is that, hey, if PIM is already implemented in switch fabrics. If you look at data center fabrics, uh, this is what a switch fabric looks like, and this is what a data center fabric looks like. If the figure is not very obvious, if you think about it a little bit, they are really very similar data uh, fabrics, right? <clears throat> and they also see similar workloads. In switch fabrics, it could happen that each input port has data to send to each output port. The same thing can happen in data center networks where each machine has data to send to uh, a unique machine, but it could also happen that Many input ports have data to send to one output port, and the same thing can happen in an in-cast scenario in data center networks. There is also the outcast scenario, where I have one input port that has data to send to all the output ports, the same thing in data center networks, and finally, I can have this all to all workloads where each input port. So this same topology and the same workloads. And that's where our key idea was, that can we take this very well understood, very well polished, protocol called PIM that's implemented in every switch protocol, every switch fabric, and generalize it to data center networks just for congestion avoidance. Okay, so a uh, little quick, very brief background that will set up the stage for the next uh, three or four minutes. Now I'm gonna jump a little more technical, yes? So the PIM protocol uh, was originally in 1993 from Tom Anderson. It was a distributed protocol to compute matchings. Uh, distributed is important here. And uh, it operates at multiple rounds. So you exchange control plane messages between input and output ports, multiple matching rounds, and then you will send one piece of data, cell or packet or however you want to think about it. Here's a very simple example. I have a switch fabric. N is the number of ports. 
and usually switches have 64 to 256 ports, let's say. Uh, the nodes in this figure represent the ports and lines represent packets that that port has to send to the output port. Um, and the way it works is you have these multiple rounds of control plane messages being exchanged. After that, you will see the blue is matched, the blue input port is matched to blue output port using a blue line, yellow, orange, green, etc. And then you can send one piece of data after this matching. Okay, that's how switches work. Okay, it's amazing that it works, right? Why does it work? Because switches have this beautiful thing that their fabric only have one RTT. The rough round trip time is a picosecond scale. And since you are transmitting this packet, which is let's say 1500 byte, right? Uh, which has roughly 120 nanoseconds transmission time, a few rounds of doing these control plane messages is okay because you're spending 10 picoseconds before transmitting one piece of data, right? So it's not very underutilized, and we know that switches can now operate at very, very high throughput. And it has beautiful properties. What has led to just like TCP? You know, I love TCP so much <laughs> that when somebody says we need to take it out, <laughs> it hurts. Uh, you know what's beautiful about TCP? Why is it so stable? Because not only we have done an amazing job in implementing it, but there are people who have built their entire career understanding the theoretical foundations of TCP and we have shown why it works. The same way PIM protocol is another example that is implemented everywhere because people have trust in it. It has beautiful, simple, beautiful mathematical analysis. If you want to look at one beautiful mathematical analysis, look at TCP and look at PIM. It says, after log and rounds of matchings, I will give you optimal matching size. This is the best matching you can ever do. This is the best throughput you can get in a switch. Log and control plane messages, right? It requires no specialized hardware. It has beautiful, simple mathematical analysis, and it's what is called randomized protocol. It uses the probabilistic decision making that is very simple and robust against worst case failures, okay, worst case inputs. So that's why we decided to think about PIM, and we said, let's see if we can generalize it to data center networks, and there were many, many challenges, as you would have imagined. The first challenge is data center does not have 64 ports. It has 100,000, 500,000, millions of machines, probably, right? Many, many ports. If I'm going to spend log n rounds, <laughs> right, log n is 25 rounds. I told you 10 microseconds of unloaded RTDs. I'm gonna spend 250 microseconds just for matchings uh, before sending a packet for, you know, 120 nanoseconds. That's not gonna work. Okay, the second thing is, uh, as, uh, uh, as I said, the round trip times are very large. So this is where the technical part was, okay? Uh, so this is the extending PIM to data center scale, DC PIM. Uh, the high level idea is that we are gonna show uh, that data centers are actually different from switches. In switches, it might happen that every input port has data to send to every output port. In data center networks, can you imagine a million machines having data to send to every machine in the data center? A million machines? No, right? Machines usually have tens or 20 active flows, 50 active flows, maybe 100 active flows, right? But not more than that. And that leads to this uh, new analysis that we did. We showed that if your input-output matrix is actually sparse, you don't need log and rounds. You are done with constant number of rounds. And a small constant, four. Just with four rounds, you can get the same properties that PIM gets you. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the second one is this uh, large RTDs, um, because data centers have these large RTDs. And here our insight was that PIM protocol in the switch fabrics was doing multiple rounds of matchings and then sending what data packet. That's not good, right? But that is because switches already run at very, very, very high rates. Data centers are rarely run at 100% <laughs> utilization. So why do we have to separate these two out? We can parallelize these. We can compute the matching for the next round, right? And uh, while we are sending the data for the current round. So that's something I'm gonna sh to show you. Um, we have generalizations in terms of each sender being able to uh, talk to multiple senders and receivers in parallel. And there's a mechanism similar to TCP and PHOST that actually takes care of in-network congestion. Uh, so I'm going to focus a lot about the first two because that's where interesting things are. We also have a very fast 
uh, loss recovery mechanism. Some of you may have heard of a paper called NDP, which was, in my opinion, one of the beautiful papers that improved upon PHOST by introducing a fast loss recovery mechanism. Um, and uh, uh, But NDP requires a specialized hardware. DCPIM can do it without any hardware modifications. Okay. So how do we compute these matchings? Sorry, I'm going to show you a formula in a developer's conference, but uh, it is such a beautiful thing that, ah. Okay, so <laughs> what this formula is showing is the following, yes? Uh, I'm not going to walk through, but the point is, if the average number of active flows, not the maximum number of active flows, if the average number of active flows across all machines, right? So you have 10 active flows, you have 40 active flows, you have only one active flow, I will take the average, if the active number of num average number of active flows per uh, senders and receivers is a small constant, then DCPIM gets you in four rounds, it gets you near perfect utilization. Whatever PIM will get you, PIM is already optimal. Okay? And if you make that matrix really, really dense, yeah, you will need five rounds. That's it. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the high level thing this is saying. But this formula is also very interesting for another reason. And this is the only controversial thing I'm going to say in this talk. Okay? This formula is also very interesting because there were so many claims in the community, oh, NDP performs great, oh, this performs great, oh, that performs great. But there was no analysis. Everybody was running simulations that matched their own protocol and trying to show my protocol is the best. Yes? So we did go deeper and try to explain why those protocols were performing, including my own work that I killed using this analysis. And I showed that my own paper, and some of the other papers, um, they had good performance because they were evaluated on very sparse traffic matrices. And so, in practice, when you're only evaluating on very sparse, very, very sparse, like average being one or two, if you're only evaluating on very sparse traffic matrices, you know, these protocols work fine. But as soon as you give them even slightly denser traffic matrices, which actually happens in practice, MapReduce being one example, right? They messed up. So all these performance that they were getting, uh, P-host uh, and other papers, they were really good performance because of sparse traffic matrices. And as soon as you give them dense traffic matrices, they, they start showing problems. And I'll show you some results. So this was one of the uh, things. Um, the second things I told you that uh, uh, PIM, what it does is it does matching, then data transfer, matching data transfer, and so on. For the, if we were to use it directly, there will be these periods when we will be utilizing the network, but we will be wasting a lot of network. And the idea is that if data centers are already being, not being run at 100% utilization, I can parallelize them. So what we are going to do is we are going to parallelize the matching phase and then do data transfer. While we are doing this data transfer, we will use the remaining network bandwidth with high priority control packets for matching to do the matching for the next round. And that keeps the network utilization high. Okay? So there are many more details in the paper on this. One last thing that I want to tell you about is this token talking mechanism that gets very fast feedback uh, for in-network congestion. The high-level idea is that I have this scenario. Um, when I'm matched with you, which means you can send the data to me, I'm going to send you one BDP worth of tokens. So you can send me one BDP worth of packets, which is what you want, right? In the next round, once the matching has finished. Okay, so I can send you uh, one BDP worth of tokens, but after that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you one token per data packet that I receive. So I send you one BDP worth of tokens. After that, whenever you, I receive one packet from you, I will give you one extra token. Does that remind you of something? TCP act locking mechanism or token locking mechanism. People have different names for it, but it's act locking, right? So basically what I'm doing is when you send me one data, I'm going to give you one more token, which means you will always have one BDP worth of packets in flight. And since you are the only person who can send to me, since you can only send to me after matching, that is the only switch buffering occupancy that you can incur. Because nobody else is allowed to send to me except for short flows. So for short flows, yes, uh, they can compete with each other, but short flows and long flows, there'll be only one BDP worth of data that will be sitting in front of a short flow from a long flow, okay? So the idea is very, very simple. When I match with you, I will send you these tokens. You can send me one data packet for every token, and if there is some congestion in the network, uh, for example, this scenario, then I will be able to send you only a few tokens because I'm not receiving data from you. And as I receive more data, I will start generating more tokens for you. Right? This is very standard uh, 
token clock in Kansas. And this allows us to give very fast feedback to the sender that you can use in your congestion control protocol. Okay, so now final goal, DCPIM, uh, what to integrate it with? Integrate it with your favorite kernel transfer protocol, right? <laughs> because we have taken care of short flow versus long flow, short flow latency, long flows uh, contention. Uh, it's not a replacement for existing kernel transport. Yeah, if you really wanted to do it, you could do it, but it's not a replacement. It's basically a congestion avoidance protocol for any of your favorite transport protocols, right? It's an enhancement to your favorite transport protocol. Integrating will take minimal changes. All you need to do is change your sender side congestion window to the minimum of congestion window that you're already computing and the number of tokens you have. That's it. This is the minimal change that DCTCP did to get into the kernel. And beyond that, the only two things that you need to change is send the control packet at the highest priority because that's very important for matching and uh, have this DCPIM uh, matching mechanism for congestion avoidance underneath you. It is not in the packet processing pipeline, okay? That's all you need to do and then you can use priorities if you want or you can just rely on DCPIM's minimal buffer occupancy. Okay, so some of the design details that I did not discuss is it's a completely asynchronous design. There's no clocks, there's, there's no synchronization required, there's no waiting time. As soon as you match, you get tokens, you send me the data. There's nothing synchronous about it. Uh, and this randomized PIM protocol already shows that it works. Uh, and there's, uh, there's some ideas to explore. Uh, when you go into beyond 100 gigabit links because uh, some math doesn't work out there. Okay, so we have evaluated DCPIM on a lot of things. Multiple topologies, leaf spine, fat tree, oversubscribe, different workloads, different traffic patterns, oversubscription rates and varying loads. Okay, I'm going to show you some very brief results uh, just to give you an idea. So high network utilization. So DCPIM can achieve for these evaluated workloads, DCPIM can achieve as much as 0.84 network load. What I'm going to show you here is the latency numbers. And what does this mean is uh, on the x-axis, what I'm showing you is the BDP because it, that's what really matters. One BDP for this experiment is roughly 73 kilobyte, okay? So 73 kilobyte, what is the latency for flows less than 73 kilobyte for flows 73 to 146 and so on, okay? So this is what NDP does. NDP gets pretty good latency, right? For short flows, it does well. For long flows, it has slightly high latency. At the mean, at the tail, NDP has a high latency because it actually act proactively drops packets because it uses very small buffer space. And then there's HPCC. HPCC actually forces to use very small uh, or keep the buffer occupancy very small. Uh, it gets very good uh, short flow latency, but long flows suffer a little bit, okay? And then this protocol called IOLUS, uh, what it does is, uh, uh, it enhances HOMA to handle internet for congestion in some form. Um, it suffers a little bit in low uh, and short flow latencies, but it does actually pretty well. Uh, and finally, there's DCPIM. Uh, for short flows, it does well. For medium flows, the latency is a little bit high because that's where matching overheads really show up. And for long flows, it does really, really well, okay? Uh, and long flows uh, <clears throat> basically get you high throughput, roughly speaking. So what is the trade-off? The trade-off is that we are getting you very, very good hard, uh, short flow latency, very, very good utilization. 84% utilization, I'm giving you latency within 1x or 1.2x of uh, the hardware, right? Uh, and now just, okay, good. Uh, now just uh, two more things to just show you some, uh, some more low level experiments, yes? And to show you the problems. So whenever academics write these papers, they do these large scale experiments and show you results on large scale experiments, but problems happen at minute level, right? When microscopic things are happening, bursts are happening. So in this case, what we are going to do is, I'm going to take 16 machines, create this dense traffic matrix. So 16 machines, all sending data to 16 machines. So think about 256 flows, and then I'm going to create an in-cast from 50 machines, okay? Good. So what would you expect? Well, what you expect is on the x-axis, I'm going to show you the time. On the y-axis, I'm going to show you how these protocols are behaving, okay? So let's start with HPCC. HPCC is, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful protocol, but it's kind of messed up because it uses something called PFC, right? And PFC has its side effects. When you see such large in-cast PFC triggers and your throughput drops. So PFC leads to HPCC problems. Uh, NDP and HOMA actually do, HOMA ILOS do well here. In this particular scenario, they take around 300 microseconds to converge, but they're not doing bad in the long run. So they can still find good 
uh, matchings in the end, but it just takes some more time, okay? And this EPIM basically is a matching-based protocol which is able to converge very, very quickly here. So this is only one experiment. Let me show you another uh, very interesting experiment. The important thing to take away here is that DCPM just in four rounds, 40 microseconds, it converges very quickly. Okay, the second one, I'm going to do something even worse. <laughs> I'm going to take these 144 machines and create a very, very dense traffic matrix. So every machine sending data to every other machine. Okay, this is the worst case that you can imagine. Okay, um, here's what is going to happen. For HPCC, the performance sinks, right? PFC all the time. Uh, NDP actually does, sorry, uh, NDP also performance sinks. It is related to a fundamental problem in NDP where uh, because of fast recovery, they, create, they keep uh, making in gas worse and worse over time. Home ILS also do somewhat better, uh, but uh, it, uh, it fails to really get to high utilization. And DCPM here does not do that well. Uh, it actually leads to only 0.8 uh, load, but this was really the bad case scenario, right? Uh, and it, but it is matching based and hence it is able to converge to, to a good rate. So that's, uh, there are many, many more results in the paper if you're interested. Um, but the last thing I want to show you is what gets me excited. So we took these PIM, right? Very preliminary basic implementation. We said, let's go to Cloud Lab, which is one of the experimental machines that academics have access to. Let's try to run and see what happens. Because DCPIM does not require any specialized hardware. It does not require any support. We did a very basic implementation. We said, let's just run it on Cloud Lab and see what happens. The simplicity of the protocol, right? The PIM protocol. It took us less than three days to just get everything running on Cloud Lab. It's a preliminary implementation. It does not do many things, but it took us less than three days to run it on Cloud Lab, 32 servers. I'm going to show you the results. And right now it uses a very basic retransmission mechanism because we didn't want to show you results that is dependent on some TCP kernel version. Here's the result, right? As you would expect, TCP actually gets very high tail latencies. This is all implementations running on 32 machines in Cloud Lab where we had no control over anything. Uh, and it has, uh, so on the x-axis, again, I'm showing you the BDPs. Um, on the y-axis, I'm showing the slowdown, which is comparison to the best possible performance. TCP actually has 256 times hardware performance at tail, which is the uh, whisker bar. Uh, at average, it does 64x uh, of hardware performance um, for short flows. For long flows, it actually does slightly better. Uh, and DCPM, as you would see, uh, is actually here slightly worse than simulations. We are now getting roughly 3x of the hardware performance at tail and still maintaining roughly 1.5x of the hardware performance in real system implementation. Um, so for short flows, we are within 2x of hardware performance, 30 to 70x implementation benefits over TCP and DCTCP latency right now. Um, and for long flows, uh, we are roughly 3 to 4x right now. This basic implementation is running 3 to 4x better than uh, TCP and DCTCP. My outcome of this experiment was, whoa, I'm excited. <laughs> What's next, right? And what is Nexus here, okay? This is a paper that was published in August, right? The student decided to open source everything, had 10 members of the community uh, reproduce all the results, right? Between now, between the paper was published and now, and everything is open sourced, you can go today and try out on Cloud Lab yourself these experiments with all the scripts and everything. So what is next? Um, I think what is next is I want to test the waters with you, right? We have resources um, and we have a lot of interest. Uh, and if there is interest in the community, we will, spending, we will spend energy in building DCPIM, integrating it with existing kernel transport protocols and see what benefits we can get. At least let's get the experimentation started. Let's see the evaluation started. If you're interested, please come talk to me. The current goal is to have first implementation draft within the next two to three months, uh, next two to three weeks. Uh, and then finally, getting back to where we started, uh, I think we should look into the future as the kernel networking community. Uh, there is a high performance demand, uh, and I, I really, really hope you agree that we must adapt to it. Otherwise, there'll be fewer and fewer celebratory songs about us in, in, in time. Uh, that's where I will stop. Thank you. We have one question. Yeah. Oh, 
minutes from an earlier point. What was the CPU utilization impact when you reduced the scheduler interval to 100 microseconds? Oh, very good, very good, very good. So this is already in our second paper last year, you should see. Uh, but uh, we saw roughly, um, so, okay, reducing the CPU scheduler um, granularity to 100 microseconds also required us to use what are called HR ticks because to get uh, fine grained timers. And that led to around 7% to 8% CPU utilization improvement. Uh, I don't think that's fundamental, but uh, you know, uh, that there was a CPU hit. By the way, this talk, I did not talk about CPU. Uh, DCPIM can saturate uh, 100 GPS links with three cores. If you want to compare something else that, that you heard today. But yes, there was another question. Yes. So, so I, I, you were showing a lot of graphs about how it compares to the other protocols. I was wondering if you found any cases where the other protocols compare better and if you can learn anything from that. Yes. So we have two results in the paper which uh, show when HPCC does better than us. Um, and uh, as I actually showed in those results, for some of the ranges, other protocols actually do better than us, right? It's the short flows and the long flows where DCPM does better. Right? right. So maybe I should have emphasized this that hey, other protocols do better in the middle range. No, I'm just but, wondering if, yes. you know, if there's anything to learn from that. Is there, you know, why is that and how does yeah, that Yeah, so I think the, the thing to learn that is, uh, remember if you're trying to run at high loads, right, uh, you better either send the traffic across the network or traffic will be sitting in the, inside the switch buffers, right? If you cannot sustain that high load, you will have higher buffer occupancy and high latency. So it is not surprising that by doing better load management, right, we are able to reduce buffer occupancy and hence latency as well. Right, makes sense. Yeah? Thank you. Very good. Yes, Alistair. Oh, okay. Any more? We can do maybe two questions. More. Did I see a hand go up? No. Christy, you have something to say? I do have good news. The T-shirts have arrived. <laughs> Was that because of better matching? <laughs> we can say yes, if that's the answer we're looking for. So you guys can come and see me and get them during lunch. Perfect. Okay, I'm around, so come talk to me. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.